Hi, good morning all. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all with us today. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm Ms. Bullard. Um, I've been with the Institute for the past six years. Um, I teach anti-money laundering and compliance, um, ICA, supervisory skills, and customer service and marketing. Um, this course um, will set the I guess the basis for persons who want to enter into the compliance field. Um, this is a three-tier course. Um, this is just introduction. Um, introduction lasts for about five weeks. Um, the time is 9.30 to 12 noon. Um, normally we have a 30 minute break but it seems that they have incorporated the break already into the time. This is, is a three hour course. And the course is very comprehensive. It requires a lot of reading and many persons have difficulty reading. And so persons may, you know, who don't have a difficulty reading may feel that that's, you know, very remedial, but for the most part, um, persons have a difficulty reading and for the ones who can read, sometimes persons have a difficulty comprehending. And so this course, um, we don't want to just remember, you know, you know, a lot of definitions or phrases or, you know, um, a one way approach to doing things, but we, we want to truly understand at the end of the day and then go back into our institutions and, and be able to apply what we would have learned. Okay, so just a small introduction. Welcome, um, any questions so far? Are we allowed, <clears throat> excuse me, good morning. Are we allowed to record um, the lecture? Okay, so yes, you should be able to record, but if you look in the, top left hand corner it's being recorded and so right after the recording um Miguel will have it available on the school's website and so you can reach out to Miguel if you don't have the address and find out how you can get a copy of the recording but but sure by all means you can record if you'd like yourself that's no issue Excellent. at all thank you okay very good very good. So I sent out an email to everybody, a welcome note, and th there were some attachments. Um, did anybody get a chance to peruse the email that I sent or the attachments? 
Yes. Hi, I didn't receive any email with attachments. Okay, what's your name? Jenny. Okay, Jenny. Um, right. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share the screen so you'll be able to see them. And then right after the lecture, um, we'll email that to you. Um, what's your last name? Mezidor. Sorry? Mezidor. Okay, Mezidor. Okay. Okay, I just made a note. And right after the lecture, we will um, send that to you. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, okay, so what we want to do is we just want to pull up um, the email and we will look at the instruction page. Just so we're clear on what everybody has to do and any deliverables and the grading system. Okay, so I'm just gonna pull it up on my screen, try and share my screen, and hopefully we will be able to see that. Okay, introduction. Okay, can everybody see the screen? Hello? Are we out no. there? Anybody out there? We can see the screen. Yeah, we can, we can see the. I would like to see the screen. Okay, excellent, excellent. Okay, and so the course is introduction to AML and compliance systems. Um, this is just a small in, instruction sheet to you know guide you through the course um, and let you know how you achieve um, full marks because it's very easy to um, you know achieve full marks. But like I said, it requires, it's very comprehensive. It requires lots of reading. And then once you would have read, you know, you have to comprehend and, and understand. And so um, the instruction sheet, um, there are four questions on the instruction sheet. Um, the course is made up of, if you look at the front of your book, it says class participation of 10%. And that's, that's very, very important. Um, I need some feedback. Um, this course is discussion-based. And so what you should do is read the chapters. There's a schedule with all the dates. So you read the um, chapters and we come and we um, have a discussion and you ask any questions and we would read various cases to, to help bring light to um, you know, any questions or queries you may have. And so that's how you get the 10% um, for Hi, sorry, I have a question. Sorry? I have a question. I just wanted to make sure that I'm in the right class. Okay, what this class should you be in, Jenny? The employment law. Okay, no, this is an employment law. Okay, okay I'm in the wrong class. Ah, okay, is there anybody else? Okay, this is introduction to AML and compliance. Oh, uh, no, I'm looking for the, I got this link, but Ms. Archerson, like, I can't get into that one. Okay, so um, can y'all excuse me for five minutes? Let me just just take um, a look at chapter one, start to read chapter one, and let me just call Miguel, because it seems like, you know, I see some other yeah, people Miguel in this sent, Miguel sent this link. Miguel sent the link. Okay, so there seems to be a cross with um, the link. Okay, so okay. Jenny, I'm gonna call him and let him know, and then you can just leave, and, yes, and then I'll ask him to send you a new email. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Okay. I'm also getting some feedback. Hello. From Hi. I'm good, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Miss Dean. Yeah, Miss Dean. I'm glad that you're you here. You in the wrong class, eh, Margaret? Miss Dean. Okay, Miss Dean left, but uh, Miss Dean apparently Miguel has sent a cross link. I, I think um, some persons were employment law. Okay, okay, so if anybody else um, is in the wrong class, you know, today is the first day, so um, you know, we may have some hiccups getting sorted out, but please excuse us. Let me just give him a call so he knows. Okay, great. Um, thank you for that. So do 
is everybody who is in here now is supposed to be an introduction to AML and compliance. Yes. Okay, great, great. So we were on our instruction sheet. And again, um, the book says, you know, 10% for class participation, 20% for quizzes and homework, and 70% is the final um, examination. So on our instruction sheet, um, there are four questions, and each question has a um, due date. And the expectation is that you, you know, complete the essay, send it in, and it will be graded. And that essay will be 20% um, of your homework that goes towards your final grade. And so it says, you can look in the ITA um, handbook. I didn't attach that, but I will attach that um, right after the lecture. So you can look um, through pages 17 to 19, and it just tells you um, how to reference. Like I said, this course is three tail. Um, it starts with introduction where we're at right now, which is four to five weeks. And it's just an overview of what AML and compliance is. The next step is the intermediate section. The e intermediate section lasts for 10 weeks. Um, that's the second step. And then the third step is the International um, Compliance Association Diploma. And that is split into two um, sections. It's nine months of anti-money laundering and nine months of governance, risk, and compliance. And introduction and the intermediate section was born out of, you know, persons not having any compliance experience, wanting to go into the um, ICA diploma, and they weren't very successful. And so what we did is we, um, you know, put together these courses to assist persons to, you know, make that decision because the cost of the ICA is way much more than introduction, as well as the time frame, which is like four weeks, five weeks for introduction and 18 months for um, ICA. And so this course is just to help you make the determination, is this for me? Um, can I handle the comprehensiveness? Can I handle the reading that's required? Do I understand? Um, Will I, sorry, somebody said something? No? Okay. Yeah, do I understand? And then will I make that decision to go all the way to complete the diploma? And so again, like I said, this introduction is just to help. And again, the 20%, again, it's just to practice because you, these same questions you will see again on um, your final exam. So this will give you, um, you know, a good little test to, see if you understand and if you comprehend and if you can be successful um, in the final. And of course, it's the final is very achievable. Um, we will discuss all of these um, questions. There are, there are eight chapters in the book. They are very, very small. They are about two pages, um, just a small overview um, of each section. And like I said, then you make the determination if you wanna go on to the next steps. And so, if you find it difficult reading the two pages, the three pages here, then definitely um, compliance is not for you. And again, that nothing is wrong with that. Um, we still encourage everybody to um, go. This is a good course. As you know, that training in anti-money laundering and compliance is a statutory requirement, which means it's required by law. And so everybody should do compliance training at least once annually. And so as we go through the chapters, we will, um, you know, learn about the statutory requirements related to the course. Okay, and so there, there are four questions taken from, you know, various chapters throughout the book. Each question is worth 10 points. And what I encourage persons to do is, you know, as we're going through the topic, like number one is gonna be taken from chapter one, you know, you just make 10 points based on what you would have learned in the chapter and then you go and do research and you add the meat to it and that's how you formulate your essay. The same introduction, body and conclusion. I, I encourage everybody to take English 119. The Institute all, also offers that because I, I find that a lot of persons, um, you know, probably need a refresher on English 
and nothing is wrong with that. You know, um, some of us um, haven't been to school for about 10 years or this is our refresher course, but I do encourage you to take um, English 119 because it helps you formulate, you know, the right structure of your essay and um, avoid the copy and paste. A lot of times persons just go on the internet because there's a vast amount of information out there and they copy and paste black. This is what placement is about. And so of course, you know, we get no points. I send that essay right back to you and say, please do that. So that's why I have, please avoid um, copy and paste because the course is really about, do you really understand? And once you understand, can you go back to your organizations and apply your understanding and then make decisions because compliance is decision based. And again, just like reading, we may feel like reading is very remedial and it comes naturally. It really, really doesn't come naturally to everybody. Decision making also doesn't come naturally to everyone. And so therefore, um, you know, it requires research. You need to make sound decisions. You need to say my decision is based on A, B or C. Okay, so lots of reading and research is required to successfully complete this course. Okay, any comments? No? Okay. Well, I hope everybody could get their 10% for participation in this first class. Now we only have four classes and, and a review. So you all have to start talking back to Ms. Bullet so I can I get to know you all, okay? And which leads me to the second part of the instruction sheet, which is 10% um, um, of your final grade. And it's very important. So uh, we're in a compliance class and as um, compliance professionals, we are required to read the newspaper every day. And so of course we don't wanna read the comments and the, the weather report, but we wanna read the business section and um, we want to be able to come back to class and say, you know, I would have read the newspaper and I saw this related to finance or banking or AML or what have you. And that's how you get your 10% of participation. Um, you would also find that, you know, we just passes us mm -hmm. by and we don't have the opportunity to read. We may have perused the book. And, and sometimes Ms. Bully will be talking, talking, talking. And and we don't even know what Ms. Bullet is talking about. So sometimes we'll have to go into the book and there are various cases. Like I said, the chapters are very small. There are eight chapters, but your book may be a lot thicker. At the back of the book, you'll see various cases that we will discuss that will, you know, help bring some light to the course and help bring some understanding, okay? And so after you would have read, read the newspaper every day, and, and by all means, if you work with countries like, uh, China or Paris or France or the UK, um, if you work in the offshore field, by all means, um, the, everything is online. Go online and also read their newspapers because you want to keep abreast with what's going on in, in the countries where you do business with, with your organization. Okay? And so a very easy way that I found that I'm able to keep up, you know, um, with the news from around the world, because I have worked in the offshore field for about 15 to 20 years. And so um, what I do is on Facebook, I subscribe to the, you know, the French news, the Swiss news. And a lot of times they just come across my feed. And if anything interesting happens, you know, I click on it and, you know, I do some more research to find out. And I found that to be very helpful because one day the Swiss news came across my Facebook feed and I saw a name and I was like, uh, the Narastron, I, I know that name. I know that name from somewhere. And I wonder where I know that name from. And I went to our system and I plugged that in and both the Narastron showed up. Strawn, that, that, was that you in the Swiss news? No, no response, I guess not. Okay, so, you know, that name showed up and that person was charged, charged with money laundering. And so I was able to be proactive, block that account and you know prevent persons from automatically taking the money out of the bank uh, of course that's the first thing that they do once they're charged they do a bank run and so that's you know the benefit of reading the news around the world from the countries that you do business with okay um i also encourage you to subscribe to the social media sites or follow the bahamas financial services board the central bank of the bahamas um who is the the regulator for the banks and the credit unions, but 
if you're in the securities business, please follow the Securities Commission. If you're in gaming, please follow the gaming board. And you would see that right through your email, pertinent information of what's going on in, in the industry or in the sector would just pop up and it, it makes it all easier to, you know, um, keep track of this information. Um, the Attorney General Office has also been putting out a lot of industry updates in terms of our blacklisting as a country, um, the Financial Action um, Task Force, and any other um, website, you know, that is applicable to your organization. And all you have to do is sign into their website. There is a slot that says subscribe. You put in your email address and all this very good information comes to you um, each day. And a part of my job in the compliance department was to disseminate information. And at one point, Central Bank came in and they audited us and they asked me, Ms. Bullard, please show us where you would have disseminated this information throughout your organization. And I was very surprised at, um, you know, that they were doing that check and they, they really wanted to see that, you know, some information had came out. Um, a policy had been updated about the credit department. They wanted to see that I had shared that with the credit department. Um, information came out about um, finance and they wanted to see where I had sent that information. So we want to get into the practice of, you know, subscribing, knowing what's going on in our country, knowing what's going on in our industry. Okay. And then of course, we don't want to just get this information and it all goes to our junk box. We actually want to go through it and you won't be able to read all of it, but you know, some of it and you come and you share with the, the class and if you're in the compliance department, this should be happening where you would get this information and then you would have discussions with, you know, the various departments within your organization. Okay. Um, is this clear so far? Um, I am not getting any feedback. Um, e Wood, I, uh, is this clear? Yes, ma'am. Yes. yes. Okay. It's clear. Okay, great. Stephanie. But one, one thing, one thing, um, one question though, in terms of when you disseminate information on policies or regulations come down from various boards, how do you do that? Do you do training or you just send out a memo? Well, it really just depends on what comes out. So let's just say when the information came out about training, um, I sent that, I'm sorry about credit. I sent that to the credit department, spoke with the manager and I said, it's just staff aware. And she said, yes, my staff is aware. However, there has been one slight change and that is something that, you know, I will sit with them individually and go through. Um, there were other times when, you know, um, stuff came out, you know, about AML, uh, all the laws would have changed in 2018. And so, of course, they did a complete revamp and re repeal. And so our AML um, policy was changed drastically. So, of course, then we had to um, hold um, full trainings for the staff. So it just depends on the magnitude of what they send out or how, how much it's changed and where the, the, the department is. But at minimum, you are to send out the information and then let the uh, manager of that department let you know if training is required and how, okay. to what it's said. Okay? Okay, yes. I get it. Okay, great, great. Okay, and so, of course, we know we live in a world where networking is very important and many people decide, you know, make decisions for, I guess, employment based on who they know. And so, there is a 5% extra uh, bonus point for you to attend Toastmasters, Rotary, or the Kiwanis Club, or any other industry update, any seminar. And um, again, all of us are in this class. At the end, there is, I think, 15 or 16 of us. All of us will be, um, you know, get the first designation, the first step. All of us will be qualified. But if there is a job available, what would distinguish us from the rest, right? It's really people just decide on based on who they know. So corporate Bahamas, they don't hang out to the dock. They don't hang out to the fish fry. They hang out to Toastmasters, Rotary, and Kiwanis. And that's where um, 
you know, you have those water cooler conversations, you introduce yourself, um, you get to know the people who make the executive decisions, okay? And so I encourage you, all of these are on Zoom now. And so if you need help um, with an invite, um, let me know. I have persons, you know, I, I'm teaching about three sections now. I have persons in the other section too would have been already and found it to be a very beneficial experience. And so they will invite you. Or if you don't have a problem researching yourself and just attending, um, we want you to come back and share your experience with the class. And once you would have done that, you get your 5%. And so you may think about, oh, Miss Bullet, this is already so much. Why I even, you know, why would I want 5%? For the scholars, the 5% is the difference between an A and a B, right? And you need at least 90% to get an A. And you would have seen persons with 88 and 89. They said, Miss Bullet, I was one point away. Okay, so this is how you you know you be proactive rather than reactive and then some persons are at the borderline and to pass the course overall is 70 percent and so therefore this is the difference between 65 and 70 this little five percent is pull a lot of people you know over over to where they need to be so they don't have to do a redo and so a redo is 150 dollars that you have to pay to the institute and most of the times the redo is a, a bit harder because we have to change it up from what we actually discuss in class, okay? So please um, get your 10% right up front, uh, get your 5%, it's very easy to get. And then the 20%, you could go into the final, you do your homework. So that's what, 35%, half, you're halfway there. You can go into the final exam comfortably with 35% knowing that you know, I'm comfortable, I don't have to worry about passing, um, I feel confident, and you can go into the um, final exam. So the final exam will be 15 multiple choice questions, and then seven essays. And of course, you know, people are like, oh my God, Miss Bullet, seven essays. It's achievable, it's been done. Um, it's the structure for the last 10 years, and it's been, it's been successful. And, and, you know, it sounds overwhelming up front, but as we go through the course, you will see how achievable it is. Okay? Are we good? Yes. Excuse me, Ms. Pilar, you just have a question, please? Yes, go ahead. It's pertaining to the um, the visiting one of the Toastmasters or Rotary or Kiwanis Club. Uh, is this a one-time visit or this is every week or something? No, it's just a one, it's a one-time visit, but the majority of persons who have attended have been found it so beneficial that they actually gone back and joined. So it's really up to you, but just for the purpose of this class, it's a one-time visit. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Okay, so are we clear with the instructions? Um, do we see the dates for our homework? Um, do we see that it's due at 11.59 and if we get it at 12.01, you get some points off, so you wanna ensure that you know if time runs up on you, you just pick another week. No, I don't see that. Sorry? I don't, no, see, I don't see it. I don't see it. You don't see you don't see the time? Yeah, the time is there on the instruction seat. It's there. Sorry, I can't hear you. Where are you looking? I'm looking at the actual book. No, I'm looking at the instruction sheet. It should be on the screen. Can you see the screen? The only thing I'm seeing on your, the screen is saying Zoom. Yeah, yeah I'm seeing Zoom too. too, but I perused the um, sheet because you emailed it to me, so. So you can't, you can't see no, my I, screen? No. Yeah, no. Your, your screen is showing Zoom. Yeah. It's showing Zoom, wow. Okay, let me see, perhaps because, um, let me stop the share and start again. Um, perhaps because, Miguel may have done some changes. Let's see. Is that better? Oh, now I can see. Yeah. Okay. okay. So there we go. Do we see the times? Do we see the points? Right mm -hmm. there. And we can select one of the four essays. I'm still not seeing it. I'm just saying Ms. Bullard has started screen sharing. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. I I went out and I went back. If you look at the email, do you have the email that I sent you? I do. Yeah, so I'll look at it to my phone. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good. Good. So if you have any questions, um, feel free 
um, just to stop me as we go through and um, I'm good. I also need um, lots of feedback. You know, like I said, it's discussion days. And so it's re really, you read the chapter, we come and we have a discussion. If not, then we would read um, the book. Um, has anybody had the opportunity to read the first two chapters this year? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So we have some good questions today and we'll have a good discussion. Yes. yes. One, but one thing I was concerned about on page seven, I'm not able to see the, the three steps of money laundering. I mean, I can understand the concept of what is going on, but the writing is not clear in my textbook. Okay. The diagram so that says... Mm -hmm. Okay, so perhaps you can take that back to Mrs. to the office and they'll give you a book that should be clear. Okay. Okay, but we'll go through it and I am certain by the end of this course, you will understand it 100%. But for clarity, then just get a new book and, and ensure that you can see all the verbiage. Okay, thank you. Okay, excellent. Okay, very good. So let me just give you, before we get into the text, um, you know, there are eight chapters and at the back of the book, you will see cases one, two, and three. Um, we are actually gonna go through case one today. So it'll just give you an overview of compliance. Um, but let me just tell you that um, compliance was established um, back in 2000 or the compliance department was established back in 2000. And I don't know if, you know, some of you may be very young, some of you may, not even been born in 2000, but what happened was that we were blacklisted, the Bahamas was blacklisted. And so internationally, um, the regulators around the world, which is like the IMF, IMF the FATF, um, the Basel Committee, ETB. they established um, um, 40 recommendations. Actually the FATF did, and I, that was another, if we look at my screen again, I would have attached this in, um, the email that I sent. And so they put out these 40 recommendations, what they termed international standards. And so what the expectation was that each country would, based on these recommendations, put laws in place to be able to combat anti-money laundering and terrorist financing. And so from these um, 40 recommendations, the Bahamas would have put in a AML, anti-money laundering framework to support these 40 recommendations. So how law starts is from international standard, then we put, um, and this is the international standard. Then there is Bahamas law, which is like the financial transaction reporting act and the proceeds of crime act. And there are seven um, laws and we'll cover that in, in chapter three, the various laws Bahamian laws that have been put in place to satisfy the 40 recommendations. And then each regulator, and the regulators are like the Central Bank of the Bahamas for the banks, um, the Compliance Commission for the accounting firms, law firms and real estate that have a corporate service providers arm, the Securities Commission for the securities business, the Insurance Commission for the insurance businesses, and then um, there's one more, the gaming board for the gaming houses. And so all those laws would fall up under one of those um, local regulators. And so each regulator then issues its guidelines. And this is the central bank guidelines, because what I found is that a lot of regulators, this is, each law is like a hundred pages right, or 100 plus pages. So the regulator, they give you a condensed version of what the law says. And then it's, you know, they put it in layman's terms. And so this is 91 pages. And so what I found that each other regulator, Securities Commission, um, the gaming board or what have you, when it comes to anti-money laundering, they take portions of um, the central bank guidelines, which are applicable to their business, so I like to use this like as our reference. And so for the purpose of this course or whenever you work in the compliance department, anywhere in the financial services sector, you know, we term this and I don't wanna degrade the Bible in any way, but we, we determine this as our Bible and our go-to policy for all the information that we need. So you would see that this is, um, like I said, 91 pages and 
you know, the Securities Commission has like a 14-page document. They have about three or four documents, um, you know, related to AML that they would have taken portions of this. So this is a good reference point when you want to find out um, information about, you know, AML and compliance. And so as we scroll through, we can see that the Bahamian anti-money laundering, they just play the framework is there which is the Anti-Terrorism Act and the Financial Transaction Reporting Act, which I said like earlier we would cover in chapter three. And so internationally, they put out those 40 recommendations. These are the 40 recommendations. Then the Bahamas put in their law. And after they would have put in their law, each regulator would have established a guideline. This is the guideline. And from those 40 recommendations, the FATF came back in, in, and this was in 2000, they said, the Bahamas only put in a shell. These laws cannot, you know, send anybody to jail. They will not hold up. Um, this is not sufficient. And so we are going to blacklist you until you get up to par with, you know, international standards. And so in 2001, you know, we did a little bit of a revamp. And then the FATF did a revamp as well. They changed some of the laws. And then we had um, the terrorist attack of 2001 in America. And so along with the 40 recommendations, they came up with nine more special recommendations that were specific to terrorism. And so, of course, they wanted everybody around the world to update their laws to ensure that, um, you know, persons who participated in terrorism would be able, you know, would be punishable by law. The crime, it would be a crime and it would be punishable by law. And so because the Bahamas used the staggered approach, because you have to understand that regulation is very expensive. Um, you have to, again, hire before 2000, there was no compliance department. After 2000, in order for, you know, the rollout of these um, guidelines and these laws to be successful in each institution, you had to hire an MLRO, and, which is the money laundering reporting officer. You had to establish a compliance department. And not only after you would have established the department, you had to train everybody on um, what compliance is and, and how it works and how we um, abide by the law and how we implement it into our um, organizations. And so not only that, that you need to hire these people, they need to be trained, then they have to train the entire organization, then you have to put systems in place. And if any of us have worked, you know, in organization, we know that these systems are very expensive and they require a lot of training and they require a lot of maintenance. And nobody was giving any institution money to, you know, put all this infrastructure in place. And so therefore, we had to take a staggered approach because a lot of organizations simply could not afford it and they shut out. And so we would see that our um, banking sector over the last 20 years when, you know, these regulations first came in place, it's severely condensed. Um, banking used to be 20% of GDP. It's now 3%. We lost 17% based on all of the banks that had to close due to not being able to um, put the infrastructure in place not being able to hire a compliance officer or MLRO. And then depending on the amount of customers they had, they not only need to hire like a one man band, they had to hire an entire department. And so all of that was very expensive and hence it affected the way we did business, of course, and a lot of businesses closed out. So we managed to get off the backlist shortly after 2001, and then we were great listed. And again, um, we went along for about 70 years being blacklisted for one thing, coming off and, you know, the government tried its best to um, satisfy all international requirements. But again, in every time we put some laws in place, it, it wiped out our sector a little bit further. And so we had, like I said, we used the staggered approach. And so what happened was in, 2017, and that was the next document that I attached, there was a mutual evaluation report done. And now internationally, everybody was working on enforcement. Um, we had had one done before we were on the grade list. 
But in 2017, they said nothing. This is it. You have had 17 years. Compliance is now 17 years old. By now, everybody should have been trained. All the regulations should have been in place. The banks or the financial institutions that are able to survive, you know, putting all the infrastructure in place, putting the the um, department in place, they now know that they can afford it and what is needed to be done, now we are going to enforce. And so not only for the Bahamas, but around the world, um, they did mutual evaluation reports and they found that the Bahamas was still up until 2017 deficient in 22 of the 40 recommendations. And so this is the report for the Bahamas and in your spare time, you can peruse it. It'll be very helpful as we go to the course and you will see they list each 40 recommendation and they say whether the Bahamas was compliant, largely compliant or not compliant at all. So in 2018, to satisfy you know, those 22 where we were deficient, they repealed and revamped all of the laws um, related to anti-money laundering to ensure that they put the meat in place. And so now since 2017, as you know, if we listen to the news, we see that a lot of people that are being brought before the courts are not only charged like with stealing by reason of employment or fraud, which were, was in the past a lesser crime, they are now charged with stealing by reason of employment and money laundering. Fraud and money laundering, if we listen to the TV now, because the laws are in place, they're now being enforced and we're being internationally watched to ensure that, you know, we didn't just put a check the box system in like we did years ago, um, that it's actually effective, it's being enforced and it's working, okay? And so that's how the compliance department was established way back from 2000. And it's not like the operations department that, you know, Royal Bank says I've been open for 108 years. For 108 years, they've had operations and finance in HR, but only since 2000, we would have had the MLRO or the compliance um, department, okay? And compliance is a regulated function which means that an institution can put an ad in the paper and say, I want to hire Ms. Bullitt to be my compliance officer. I can interview and they can say, Ms. Bullitt, you are the one. However, they have to go to the regulator and get the regulator's approval. And in that approval from the regulator, there's a background check. You have to send your CV, you have to send financial references and you have to be interviewed. And it's a process where they you know, go in to make sure you're a sound in individual. They call it fit and proper for the position and then you are approved. So in most institutions, there are three regulated functions. It's senior official one, senior official two, and then the MLRO. So you want to ensure um, that your finances and everything. If, if you work in the gaming um, area, you'll be familiar with these background checks and these regulated functions. Because in gaming, they are scrutinized more, but in banking, it's just those of, you know, the other financial areas, it's just those three um, positions that, you know, require the regulator's approval before you get the job. Okay. Any, any questions? No. No? Be very quiet. Nobody um, getting their 10% today? No? Uh, I was... No, I have I have a question of when you when you when you spoke about the mutual evaluation and that we're being watched internationally. Is that um being are we being watched just by the United States or by the EU as well? Yeah, by by the EU more so. Okay. Okay. But yeah, because most of the FATF is made up of, of the European U Union. And it's not like the U.S. that blacklisted us. It's, it's um, the FATF or the CFATF, which is the Caribbean region. Okay, got it. Okay, and we also blacklisted by the EU. But as we go through the course, we'll talk about, you know, the various bodies that would have blacklisted us. Okay. Okay? Okay, great. Okay, so that's the report. So you would know um, all the attachments that I would, you know, would have sent and... and the reason I sent them just so you know you would be familiar with how they look and when you go and do your research, what would be your reference points? Okay. Okay, good. All right. So now because this class is so very quiet, 
we want to go to case one. And I'm going to pick a name from this list. Let's see who is going to get their 10% today. And I like to pick on the guys because we normally don't have much of them, but I'm very proud that we have a few today. So very good. So I'm going to, where's the person? Jason, L. Jason Davis. Do you want to um, turn to the back of your book where it says case one and, and read for us? No response? Jason? Okay, again, a little light from, this is from Jason. Let's see. Oh, okay. All right. What about uh, Sierra Bonaby? Hi. Hi, Sierra. How are you? Good. Okay, you have your book? Yes, I do. Okay, but you're very low. Could you speak up a little bit? You can hear me now. I can hear you, but you're very faint. Hello. Okay. Uh, okay, can can everybody else hear Sierra? Yes. Okay, yes. Good, good. Okay, Sierra, so let's turn to the back. And so just to give you a little overview of what compliance is about and, and becoming a new compliance officer. You want me to read? Yes, please. You oh. get your 10% in the first class. Okay. Okay. Um, so you just became the new money laundering officer. Five ways to help you get started. Compliance officer, a corporate official whose job is to ensure that a company is complying with regulations and that its employees are complying with the internal policies and procedures. Congratulations. You have just become part of what, it, what is perhaps the fastest growing and hardest profession in the world. Money laundering compliance officers, MLCOS, are highly sought after professionals and quite scarce. Huh? Someone said something? No. No, go ahead. Oh, okay. I am certain you are already overwhelmed with both the challenges and the prospects of your new position. The following five ideas aim to help you embark on a fruitful and exciting journey where you can learn and at the same time prove to be a valuable asset to your organization. One, make time to understand your business. For an MLCO to be effective, he or she must make the time to really learn and understand the business he or she is trying to protect. Writing policies, reading, sus reading sus suspicious reports, monitoring and training become pointless if you do not understand the environment you are in and the needs of your peers at the front line. Take time to sit with them, engage in their day-to-day -day activities, and make inquiries in regards to the challenges they face and issues with they need help. Ask and be prepared to listen to what they have to say. That will help you truly understand what they are doing and how they can become a valuable and necessary partner. Two, there is no shame in training. People sometimes think that when they get their dream job, they can avoid further training, mainly because they seem to mainly because they seem to have already proven that they are up to the challenge. I have news for you, this is not the case. There should be no shame in receiving training. Training should be continuous, even if you are repeating yourself. Try to find training opportunities in your area, in your town, in your country and internationally. Choose yourself carefully and try to find those seminars or workshops that will help you in successfully dis discharging your duties. Trainings can even provide you with ideas for conducting your own training for your colleagues. There are many training opportunities on anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing, AML or CTF, but there are also more specialized ones about the role of the MLCO and writing MLCO reports. It is important to realize and appreciate that the costs for such trainings are very small when compared to the personal benefits you will receive and or more importantly for your organization. Three, seek resources outside of your immediate environment. Do not concentrate just on the local legislation and the relevant regulatory guidelines or directives. Those are obviously important, but they are not enough. It is equally, if not more important to broaden your horizons. The European AML directives apply across all of Europe, so you will find that there is more guidance out there that will help you understand your duties and how to be more effective. There is also useful guidance from U.S. Regulat regulators, 
the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, Australia, New Zealand, and more. Just, just use Google research. A number of professional bodies also offer free su subscription newsletters on Know Your Customer and AML, as well as general compliance and ethic matters. The MLCO role requires a lot of critical thinking and an analysis, and accordingly, I would advise you to set up your own library of guidance notes, training materials, presentations, articles, and case studies. Organize these in folders and refer to them when you are uncertain about a situation or when you feel like confirming something before you make a business decision or provide advice. Also, there are some useful and current books on AML and CTF as well as general compliance management. They can be helpful both as a tool to you, to, you get start, to you get started, but also as a reference from time to time. For memberships to professional organizations, nowadays one can find quite a professional, one can find a, one can find quite a few professional memberships organizations for AML compliance professionals. One of the best ones to subscribe to is the Association of Certified Anti-Money Laundering Specialists, ACMS. Becoming a member of one or more of these organizations opens the doors to abundant resources and practical tools to help you perform your duties and excel in what you do. Some of these organizations also offer training opportunities, seminars, and con conferences you can attend to become and stay current with what is happening in the AML world. Specifically, ACMS offers CAMS certified certification, the gold standard in the AML world. Specifically, oh sorry, in the AM, hold on, the gold standard in the AML certifications, and also organizes a number of conferences in Europe and the rest of the world. These are these are especially useful to anti-financial crime professionals. Network, network, network. Attending relevant conferences in your country or abroad is a great way to meet with peers. Networking is very important in today's fast paced environment. It is vital to exchange ideas, to share resources and experiences and to seek help. Many of the professional membership organization described offer local chapters or forums where members can gather and organize relevant and specialized trainings, exchange ideas on the way they do certain things and have fun together. Also, social media is very important. Use LinkedIn or even Facebook and Twitter to follow professional bodies and professional membership organizations that share important news as they happen. Yeah. You can then share what you have learned with colleagues. Your colleagues will appreciate the valuable and relevant information you provide. Contrary to popular belief, MLCOs can be exciting, popular, and innovate an innovative person and a valuable asset to his or her colleagues and their organization. Remember to be open and welcoming and embrace the challenges and prospects of your position and be prepared to make a difference. Okay, very, very good, Sierra. Thank you for that. Full 10 points in the first class, excellent. Okay, Thank you. good. And so I just wanna go over where they say seek resources outside your environment. Um, you A lot of times, um, if you're gonna go all the way to the ICA, um, you normally have to write three essays on the AML side, which is 25 to 3,000 words. And they normally say pick a jurisdiction of your choice. And normally, of course, you would pick the Bahamas because that's where you should be most familiar with the information. Um, I found that with Bahamian law, when we don't have a law in place, for instance, like for our digital currency, I see that the Bahamas um, normally copies the law from either the Netherlands Luxembourg or Cayman and so Cayman is um, in the Caribbean so most of the time it's most relevant and Cayman seems to have uh, you know their laws in place automatically once something is you know in the initial stage they, they pop the laws right out so and all of these are online so if you know you have to do some research and you don't know where to find it in um, um, Bahamian law or there are bodies being established to you know, uh, we need a forum or we need a group of people to come together to um, put in infrastructure or put in policies and procedures in regards to like digital currency. Those are the, you know, the countries that we get good information from. That's New Zealand, Luxembourg, and then Cayman. 
um, memberships. Um, there's the Bahamas Institute of um, Compliance Officers, that's BACO. Um, there is a form online on their website or also at the office. Um, you can join BACO as a student. Um, and again, they send you out lots of pertinent information um, as industry updates come out. Um, they hold briefings to explain to you exactly what is to be done or how it is to be done. So it's very beneficial um, for information and then staying abreast of your industry and what's going on. Um, many times, um, you know, in support of the organizations, many organize, uh, many companies, you know, they support back when they buy 10 tickets for their seminars or the industry of updates. And most of the time, one or two persons show up. And so if you're passionate about compliance, um, you know, go to your HR, go to your compliance officer and say, listen, the next time you all buy tickets for a function, I'd like to uh, attend, you'd be very surprised. There are always extra tickets there um, um, to attend. So please join as a student. And like I said, network, network, network. I already told you all where corporate Bahamas um, hangs out. Um, while I was at Royal Bank for the majority of my um, career in the trust department. And... Um, I was head of the business support before I went into compliance. And sometimes I had to make decisions. Now, compliance officers are not lawyers. You know, a lot of people think that we are lawyers, but we are not, you know. And so we do need lawyers in our network. And I used to spend about thirty or $40,000 per year just on legal work. Because when you call a lawyer, they say, hi, Ms. Bullard, it's 2 o'clock. And when you hang up, they say, it's 3.30. That means they're going to send you a bill for an hour and a half, okay? And so as I built my network and I started to attend these organizations and I started to go to seminars, I, you know, I handed out my card because I realized I had to make, um, you know, decisions. And, and a lot of times I didn't have all the information and it used to cost the company a lot um, in legal fees and other fees. And so I was able to call my network sometimes and say, hey, I just need a quick question or what is your take on this? And I was able to make better decisions and you find that that's, like I say, very beneficial. Um, later on, as I built my network and I was able to, you know, reduce um, um, the amount of money we spent on legal or consultation or advice, um, I was able to get that as a bonus. And so those same people who helped me, I shared my advice and thank you, you helped me and I got this as a bonus. So towards then, as I got more developed in compliance, I got bigger bonuses. So you develop your network and, and Again, we don't want to just go there and find people who can help us, but we want, you know, everybody has value. We want to also be able to give something back and to knowledge or understanding or, you know, sh sharing to, you know, help everybody to be successful. Okay. So any questions? No? We good? Okay, good. Okay, very good. Okay, so let's turn the book to chapter one. And, and we'll go over just what money laundering is because we're going to cover um, chapter one and two in this course. So we'll go over money laundering, we'll go over financing. And I think it's number four, case study four. Um, no, sorry, case study three, when we get to Paris financing, um, is what we're going to read. Okay. So, who, somebody said that they read um, chapter one previously? Hello. Yes, go ahead. Hi, I have a quick question. I was just going over the email that was sent and it said uh, for the homework that the further instruction would be on page 17 to 19. But yeah. looking in the book, it just says... Uh, no, that's uh, not the book. I didn't send that. I, I mentioned that I will send that afterwards. Oh, I apologize. Yeah, that, so the I, ICA handbook. I will send that so you will see um, what is required for referencing. I, okay. You know, I don't take off points so much for referencing, but as you go um, into, it's good to practice right now because um, the majority of points uh, that are being deducted right now for the persons that are in ICA is due to referencing and proper quoting. So I decided to implement it from you know, the onset. So by the time you get the ICA, you'll be quite comfortable with the expectation of referencing. Oh, okay. Okay, good. good. Okay. So so who 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 would have read um chapter one? Me. It was me. 
Erica, sorry. Erica? Okay, good, Erica, good. So tell us, tell us about chapter one and, and tell us what you would have read. What is your understanding from what you read? Okay, um, my understanding of what I read um, about anti-money laundering is basically it's telling you um, that these funds are illicit funds that are gained through various different illegal means. And what they're trying to do, what the criminal is trying to do is to incorporate these funds into the financial system somehow, whether it's um, through structuring or wire transfer from account to account to disguise the origin of the fund. And the way they legitimize their funds is through um, businesses or through purchasing high value products. And there are three different stages in money laundering. Oh, Pardon me? Okay. Somebody talk here. Thank you. So somebody, somebody else was talking. Can everybody else mute their mic, please? I don't think they were talking to us. Sorry, Erica, go ahead. Okay, and from what I understand about um, money laundering, there are three various stages, which is placement, um, getting the funds into the financial system by cash deposits, uh, layering, which, um, where they, after the funds are in the financial system, they move the funds around through various different accounts and, and um, integration is where they use the funds once the origin is discouraged. They use the funds to purchase elite, um, like properties, anything of value, diamonds, so that they can legitimize the funds and um, make it look legal. Okay, Erica, very good. Yes, spot on, very good. Um, that's exactly what happened. So what we have is illegal funds and what the persons try to do, um, they derive the, these illegal funds from criminal activity and then they try and place it in the system by infusing it in the financial system. And let me just give you, um, you know, a more relatable story that happened with me years ago when I was at, this was back in 2000, you know, the laws had just come out and we were not really familiar and, you know, we were on a learning curve. And so we had a good um, car wash guy that, you know, he used to wash all our cars and um, he was very striving, showed up to work every day. He was always on time and he always made sure, you know, our cars were clean and, um, I was a teller supervisor at that time, and he came into the bank and he said, Miss Bullet, you know, I make a lot of money from y'all, especially on payday, and I want to start to save. And I said, okay, good, good. I'm, I'm so happy. So I said, you know, bring these documents in, and I will open up an account for you, and, you know, we will start a savings for you. And that's exactly what he did. And so he came in, he bought his passport, his NIB, his proof of address. And at that time, um, the law also um, required you to establish a profile. And this is very important because even up to today, I see some um, businesses not ensuring that people establish a profile and, and that they check it properly. And so in establishing that profile, um, you know, we knew that he was outside washing cars, you know, most places today, because the laws are changing to 18, they are now enforcing, they ask you for a job letter. And so, of course, he was self-employed. And so we said, okay, um, we think that you, you make, let's say, about $200 a week in cleaning cars, and you should be able, you know, he said, I could save half of that. So our expectation was that he would, you know, at the end of the month should have deposited about $400. And so, of course, you know, this, we had savvy systems in place because this was the Royal Bank of Canada that would alert us if he um, did deposit more than the $400. But some of us work in institutions where we don't really have those savvy systems in place. And we don't have a system that will spot out and say, this person's profile says this is a, the amount he will deposit, but he has deposited more. But luckily for us, um, you know, we had a system that would spit out, you know, this is the profile amount and this is how much he deposited. Now, everything went good for the first year. 
And then the second or third year, he came in and said, Miss Bullet, I hit a lick. And I say, okay, what do you mean you hit a lick? He said, yeah, I get this $10,000. I want you to deposit to that account. And I say, you have it in cash? And, and so think about it now. This back in, say, 2001, 2002, laws had just come out. He said, yeah, Miss Bullet, I hit a lick. I say, okay, but you have to explain to me what you mean you hit a lick. And so he's like, yeah, I do a little deal with my bro and blah, blah, blah. And I come out on top. I said, okay, okay. So here it is. He is in my office now with this $10,000. Now, remember, we had established his profile. He makes $200 a week. We expected $100 to be saved. At the end of the month, only $400 should have been on this account. So tell me what, tell me what just happened when he bought in that $10,000. When he bought in the $10,000, he did not fit the profile any longer. That's why the system alerted you guys. Well, the system hasn't because he hasn't deposited yet. But right. that's something suspicious about. Right. And so, so remember back then too, the law used to, the law used to say, you know, we are to um, ask for source of funds for any amount over 5,000, and then it increased to 10,000, and now it's 15,000. But really, we are to ask for any amount that is outside of that person's profile, because even if he had brought in $2,000, I know from his salary... That would have been... Sorry, go that ahead. Would have been out, that would have been outside of his um, monthly anticipated funds right right so would Absolutely. that have to be investigated like formally investigated as to where they got he got the ten thousand from of course of course and remember now the law says we are not to tip off that client okay mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. we you know we i had to say okay you take this money and you deposit it and, and then we had to, to, to freeze it but of course you know that ruined a lot of relationships and then he was no longer our car wash guy after that. But our responsibility is as um, um, financial professionals, uh, you know, poker says you do not tip off and you do not fail to disclose. If we tip I, off or we fail to disclose, we are now liable and we can go to jail. So, Ms. Bullard, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Hello? Hi. Okay. Okay. So you see, like how you said, he came in and he brought the ten thousand dollars. Of course, that wouldn't that would have been outside of the amount that he supposed to be running through his account, I guess, monthly or whatever. So, That's like you say, account. right? So, like you say, you asked for a source of documents, meaning where he would have obtained the funds from. So, what if he was to lit like literally come with, let's just say. Uh, a suit contract and he make it up and it's 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 stating okay he would have gotten this a suit in this amount and how a special person signed and he brings that into the bank and he says okay this is where I would have got this ten thousand dollars from is that still okay for him to put on his account seeing that he would have provided mm -hmm. some for mm -hmm. of the document yes it is because again we do establish profiles based on the amount of money we, we make, but there are legitimate reasons where people come into the bank and somebody may have passed away and left them an inheritance. They may have sold the car. They may have sold a piece of property. And so there is a internal form that the institution should have that says a declaration source of funds. Source of funds. And, and so that's what the law allows you to find. This is outside of the profile. And, and so, you know, they need to declare the source of funds. Like I opened an account when I was in college. And so of course, when I was in college, I said, well, my parents are gonna be spend, sending the money here. So it's only gonna be enough for my rent. I kept that same account when I, um, you know, was working. And so they said, well, we see a salary coming in. You need to come in and update your profile. And so this is why you have to do reviews on the account because things change or I may have gotten married, or I may have gotten a promotion. So things change. So when things change, you do go and, you know, update your profile. Um, it happened with uh, Simonet, um, who was the, was he the deputy leader the other day? When Simonet, when Simonet, um, mother died, and when he first went into politics, he declared that he had $3 million. 
um, mm. his mother died, and then he declared that he had $153 billion. So, of course, there was outrage all through the news. Where did he got, get a um, hundred extra million dollars from? In five years, he had to keep the people money, right? That's where the bad money go on. And so, mm-hmm. of course, you know, the banks had to call him and say, so we noticed there were extra hundred million dollars on your account. What exactly what happened? He was able to bring in proof that his mother died and his mother had these investments and mm-hmm. had left this money to him in his will. So there are legitimate reasons, but mm-hmm. our duty is to go out, find out, and make sure that it ain't just a nascent contract that, mm-hmm. you know, this person, you know, and we can tell when it's wrong. Yeah, that was, that was really my question, because I was trying to figure out, is yeah. there a way to tell if the ACE contract is No, legit? it ain't a way, and, and, and this is another thing that I want everybody to know. We can only mitigate risk, reduce some risk by putting controls in place. We can never eliminate it. So don't break, get a heart, you know, don't be hard, don't turn over. People would have infiltrated. I mean, we show up to work nine to five and we have some hackers and, and people all around the world are sitting home so all day. And they their job is to infiltrate the financial services sector, infiltrate the system, do fraud or what have you. That's their job. So to protect ourselves. We just, we, we have to ensure that we are fully trained, we are knowledgeable, we are educated, we have proper controls in place, we understand our policy and procedure, and we do what we are supposed to do. So when the police comes, they will say, well, this person brought a fraudulent um, ASU contract, and let's look, Miss Bullet signed off on it. Does it look legitimate? Yes. Um, does the uh, bank have a system that would automatically tell her that it was fraud? No. She did the checks and balances that she was supposed to do. And so therefore we won't charge her with collusion. She is okay. She does she you know she was not negligent. What happens a lot of times is that we do not do the proper checks and balances. And we do not even know when the police comes in or audit comes in and asks the policy. What is the policy when the person goes outside of their program? Oh, I don't know. You go into jail. If a person goes outside their profile, you call them and you ask them, has something changed? You do a review on the account. Nothing has changed. Then I ask you for the, the declare the source of funds and I check the source document. Let's think about a Michelle Rackley, the, the lady who was in charge of urban renewal. She opened up an account. She was a government employee. For the most part, government employees only in the bank from government payday till the third or the fourth. If you saw a government employee in the bank during the middle of the um, month, that should be a red flag. Red flag. If you see a government um, uh, employee who open an account saying, my salary is going to come here or the I work to urban renewal, this is going to be checks to facilitate contractors. And then their personal account goes up to $1.3 million. And you never know, you ne- no system gives you an alert. No system, you know, nobody stop in and tracks to call it in once. When the police went in for CI, the C and the Teachers Credit Union, I'm sure they, they had some questions for the staff. Who was supposed to monitor this account? How did her account get the $1.3 million? Right? And she was committing fraud. This is what our job is. We are to ensure that that money is not placed into the system. And if it is placed into the system, that, you know, we are aware, we put a hold on the account or we would have done our due diligence to find out where that money came from and um, to stop it in its tracks. We then fill out a suspicious transaction report. Now, the law says anybody can fill out a suspicious transaction report, but Internally, our organization's policy and procedure says there's a compliance department, there's a money laundering reporting officer. So we give you an internal form and you fill out that internal form and you pass it on to your manager or you pass it on to compliance. And then it's no longer with you. Whichever decision the compliance officer makes is their decision. They are the ones who are going to investigate. They are the ones who are going to, are going to request that you get more information from the client. You know, we have had um, two full instances where persons say, well, I'm just a teller this above my pay grade 
I'm not um, I'm giving any more information, I'm not showing up in court. And therefore, even though failure to disclose was already in the law, it's now being enforced. So there's no, because there were too many um, compliance officers who tried to go to tellers or frontline staff and they say, oh no, that's above my pay grade. I'm not disclosing and the law don't protect you and I'm going to jail or I'm not going to court. And so they, the law is enforced that you cannot fail to disclose. The law is also enforced that you should not tip off. I shouldn't have sat there and say, now come on, Tawash Kavina, you know, I can't take this money. You know, you could go to jail for this. You best take this money and run back with this bank. Right? And he probably would have gone to another bank where they would have taken the money. Um, back in my day too, when I was in the branch, there was no, um, you know, the number of business was illegal. And a lot of people say, oh, Miss Bullet, I hit this number, come put this money on my account. Okay. And so all, all of that we, we, we went through. So, so as simple as that is, um, him, you get in, somebody winning money because like you say back then it was illegal. Yeah, they so we, we were not allowed to take account. it. Sorry. Um, and the guy who you said had the car wash business, him wanting you to deposit that money on his account, that's basically the placement stage of money yes. laundering? Yes, that's the placement stage. Okay. okay. And if you see for the, the first homework question, if you choose that one, it asks you, discuss how money is laundered in the placement stage. And so again, we don't want a definition or whatever we want. And, and all the way to ICA, I've seen this is how you get more points. You pull a, a, a story of the newspaper, you put in there loads and loads of cases of how people place the money into the financial services sector, or you put you use this story. And so this is how you, you answer that question. We don't want money laundering has three stages and it's one way. Fine, you could have an introduction. And the three stages is placement layer and integration. Fine, you get a point for that. But you will get a point when you tell a, a real life story because it proves that you understand what the book says. Okay, okay one more question. This is about mm -hmm. the homework. Um, we only turn it in one of the one of the question. Yes. You can do all four. Oh, okay. You can do all four yeah. for practice because trust me, you will see these same four questions in another way on the final exam. So if okay. I was you, I would just get it over with and just practice to make sure I have my 10 points. You know, but only one will be okay. in Ms. Okay. Bullard, I have yes. a question. Mm -hmm. if, Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, it's about the homework again. So mm -hmm. suppose we decide to do all of them like you mm -hmm. suggested and we happen to get a higher grade or something like that. Would, would we be able to ask you, say for instance, we give you the first one and we didn't do too well. Could we ask you, hey, I'm gonna do the second one. If I do better on that, can you keep that point, those points? Yep. Only if you get below 70%. The, because okay. this is open book, the expectation is that you get 100% on your homework. If you don't get 100%, you should be concerned and you should look to see where you went wrong. But if no you problem. get less than 70%, then I do allow you to do it over. If you get more than 70%, oh. no. You just look at the notes where I said you missed this or missed that. And, and, and then if you choose to do it on the final, then you ensure you include what you would have missed. Understood. Thank yeah. you. Okay, great. great. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So you're saying the homework questions, we don't have to do all of them? No, it's just one. See, it's that you only complete the, all questions. However, only one essay should be submitted for a grade. This on the, the, the introduction to AML instruction homework page we're looking at? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I thought we had to do all seeing that there was different due dates. No, read the first line. Oh, oh, okay, sorry. Okay, yeah, that's all right. We'll all get used to it in, in a few weeks. Okay, so that's fine. Okay, so we understand placement, right? And so let's talk about layering. So layering usually involves a complex system of transactions designed to hide the source and ownership of funds. And so, of course, um, we see people back in the day, in my day again, a lot of all of this has changed now. Persons would have gone into the, the financial institution 
open up an account in a company name, they would have to bring in memorandum and arts, um, passports of the signatories, um, and a, you know, an approval form to open up the account. And then they would bring in like a shareholders registry. Back in my day, a lot of shareholders registries just said, I am owned by Bullet and Co. And then the bank stopped right there. So if I am owned by Bullet and Co, how do I know if Bullet and Co is Mrs. Bullet and Ben Laden? Everybody knows who Ben Laden is, right? Or if it's just Mrs. Bullet alone, you know, by herself. And so people use that, you know, company accounts to be able to go and wire money all around the world. And what the law has now been updated again, it was in place, but it was just going to this staggered approach because we, you know, sometimes more um, looking into sales. Compliance makes no money for the business. And so, you know, everything is sales, 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 sales. And a lot of sales persons are on um, commission. Some of them don't, in the offshore world, a lot of them, they don't get paid. And so, you know, compliance had to strike a balance between is this business going to be viable? Is it going to stay open? Are we going to make money? Or are we going to enforce all these laws with, you, you know, with wipe out the financial services sector? And so, like I said, now we ask for a nominee agreement. And that nominee agreement normally says, whilst the shares are owned by Bullet and Co., the owners of the shares are Mrs. Bullard and Ben Laden. So then, of course, we know we're not going to do business with Ben Laden, so we're not going to open that account. But back in the day, we just simply didn't know who Bullard and Co. represented. And so whoever they had as the signatories, you know, once the two signatories signed, we, we, we um, you know, we sent that money. And so you would see them, um, Ms. Bullard go, goes and opens up the account under... Bullet and Co. And so all these wires going around the world saying, um, you know, they from Bullet and Co. Not knowing that's Ben Laden, you know, who is a part owner in Bullet and Co. Okay. And so they um, send money to a company account from a company account all around the world. And like I say, most companies did not, and even still today, we have some accounts that are considered. Um, you know, incomplete, or they would have been, they don't have all the KYC on file, or we don't have all the information to conclude exactly who the beneficial owners of these accounts are. Okay, and so that's a way that they use complex systems, or you would see them transfer it from an individual to a company, and then from a company to another individual, just trying to, you know, um, diminish the audit trail or diminish the real owner or the real beneficial owner of the funds. And so, um, and then we go on to um, Paris finance. Ms. Bullard, that. Ms. Bullard. Yes? Okay, uh, and on that vein, talking about the transfers and stuff, the, the issue with bearer shares, but um, that is something that's not, that that isn't um, legal anymore, or do they still have instances where persons are using bearer shares? Okay, persons are using bearer shares, and let me just tell you how the law is set up. So the law is set up is you cannot establish a bearer share account any longer in the Bahamas. Okay. Right. However, um, up until a few years ago, Panama still issued bearer share accounts. So the Bahamas was able to open up an account for a bearer share account out of Panama or the, or the Netherlands or Switzerland or from wherever else. But we, if somebody came and said, I have a bearer share account in the Bahamas, they weren't allowed to, to open it. Now, two years or three years ago, Panama said, we are no longer going to issue bearer share accounts. And on our books, we had 10 accounts that had bearer shares out of Panama. And so we had to contact our clients and tell our clients, Panama no longer issued their shares. And again, we wouldn't have known that if we did not pay attention to the Panamanian news, right? And so we called those clients and that took, I am, I am telling you that took, so I, the institution where I was still has a, one account 
still out of Panamanian fair shares. And of course, you know, we don't want to lose business. And so we're working with that person, continuously putting updates on the account that we spoke to the person, and the person is trying to regular regularize the account. So of course, you know, the risk is with bearer shares is that I can just transfer the share again to Ben Laden. I would have opened the account in my name, Ms. Bullard, mm -hmm. and then I can go and just transfer and Ben Laden can all of a sudden be the owner and passing this money around the world. And so the central bank said, while bearer shares are no longer issued by the Bahamas, but we do accept accounts of the um, Bahamian companies or banks are still able to open up these accounts. What they put in place in the law, they said there are two controls that they're going to put in place. If you open up a bear share account from another country, you are to get a letter of undertaking from the beneficial owners stating that I will not transfer the shares without letting the um, bank know. And then to the holder of the shares, the holder of the shares must also confirm that I will not transfer the share. I will not allow it, the shares to be transferred without the bank knowing. So that means if I decide I'm the owner and I go and go and transfer this to Ben Laden, I call the bank on the phone and I say, listen, I no longer want to own these shares. I'm going to sell them. Ben Laden is the new owner. The bank then has the opportunity to say, oh no, we're not going to do business with Ben Laden. Right? So that's the risk there. So those controls, the two letters, one from the beneficial owner, one from the um, holder of the shares, and then you must mark that account as high risk. That's the three controls that they have in place if you still accept bearer shares. Um, Ms. Bullet, yes? um, my question is, since the United States disregard bearer shares since 1986, why, in your opinion, do you think the Bahamas um, is lagging so far or lagged so far behind in determining that we're no longer going to be issuing bearer shares? Yeah, but we, we, at least more than five years ago, um, we stopped issuing bearer shares. But you have to understand, okay, we had a competition. Um, you know, the U.S. saw the risk involved in, and they had a lot of issues with bearer share accounts where people who they had on their terrorist list were the owners of these bearer shares. And so they shut it out to solve a problem for their country. Um, our issue wasn't as bad. We did see the risk, but again, we have to do whatever we can do to, to make money. You know what I mean? And so okay. therefore, whereas the honest people who had bear shares in the U.S. was able to bring that business to the Bahamas. You see what I mean? And then I understand. We started, yeah, so, you know, the innocent normally suffers for the bad. Mm -hmm. I understand. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. But again, you know, the offshore world is very, very competitive. And but there, there are billions of dollars out there, you, you know? And so if the US shuts off something or the EU shuts off something, we want to find a legal way to be able to accept that business because that means a lot uh -huh. of coming our way. Yeah. Yeah, but we have to do it legally. So that, that's the issue, okay? So we layer it. We send, um, you know, these buyers all around the world. And so we can diminish who's the real owner of this money. This money really is owned by Ben Laden and he really only paying to, you know, to, for his insulin or, or what have you. So we try and, and send it around the world. And so once we get this money um, into the system and it's wired now, that $10,000 would have been the proceeds of a drug deal. It's into the system now. Now I am coming back to withdraw that money because now it's clean, it's been washed. I need to pay my children's school fee. Now my children used to go to government school. Now they can go to a private school for one semester because I have this, you know. Or I need to go to school. Or I need to buy a car. That's what, you know, needs to buy a car and a nice house, right? And so this is how it, it's integrated into the system now. I, it has been clean. It's um, been washed. And now I'm going to make a withdrawal and take it to the school to pay the school fees. I'm going to take it down to Bahamas bus and truck and buy a car. Right, and so that's the stage, is and that's how it goes. It, it it goes through that process where it turns from dirty money, um, into clean money. Okay. So, are we clear about the three stages? 
and yeah. how the money is infiltrated back into the system. Yes. Okay. Okay, good, good. And so we want to talk, and this is a very popular question on, on the exam. We talk about predicate crimes. What are the underlying crimes um, that are associated with money laundering? And I, out of my ICA book, because um, it's much more detailed, again, this is just an overview. There are 21 crimes that are associated um, with money laundering. And on the final exam, this is a very easy question that a lot of people answer, they normally actually give us four or five ways in which um, money, you know, or crimes that are predicate crimes associated with money laundering. And so the book here talks about fraud and theft and counterfeiting and drug dealing, corruption and bribery, tax evasion, smuggling. And again, we don't want to answer this question by just saying fraud is when people do this or tax evasion is when this happens or that. What counterfeiting is this, right? We want to actually give an example. For an example, um, Shakira on tax evasion moved to the Bahamas and um, evaded taxes in Spain because, you know, even though she would have spent, you know, the law allows you to spend 183 days. She spent 190 days in, the, in, in Spain. And so she went over the time limit that she should have been able to spend in Spain to be considered a Bahamian citizen, she did it anyway and did not pay her, her taxes in Spain. Okay? So you wanna, if you're gonna answer that question, you wanna go online, you wanna look um, up some um, counterfeiting, you wanna look up some theft. Again, all over the news now, there was quite a number of persons um, stealing by reason of employment at CIBC, the ATM guy. You know, every week the ATM used to be down. I used to have to drive downtown to CIBC and by the time I got there, halfway on a Saturday, uh, the machine was empty. So, you know, there was something wrong. And I imagine, because I even complained to CIBC, why on the weekend there is never an ATM uh, anywhere except downtown? And so come the final months later, you see that there was big theft going on there, but then they were dragged before the courts, again, stealing by reason of employment, and stealing um, and money laundering. And then of course, we know for the first time for corruption and bribery ever in the Bahamas, again, they're now the international watch. And never ever uh, have all our politicians, you know, uh, we just law abiding citizens, never ever had a politician until, what was it, 2017 been brought before the court of the Bahamas on bribery and corruption. We must have a good country full of very honorable men in our government so you know you want to talk about the case about she and you want to talk about the case about frank smith and how um they you know went before the court and the outcomes of the, these cases okay and so this is Excuse why me, Bullard. um yeah. so what about the sorry i can't hear you pyramid schemes the pyramid sorry. Pyramid schemes. Yes. They are under the fraud thing. Fraud. Yeah, they, yeah. So like I said, there are 21 um um crimes under here. The book just lists about 10. It it really, really depends on um how they're categorized. If they did it online, it might be under a cyber crime. It really it depends. Okay. okay. Fraud um, or 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 cyber crime. Okay. okay. Yeah, and so it goes on. It says that the, the Bahamas Proceeds of Crime Act, the predicate crimes are referred to as identified risk, and you know there are charges. You know when persons go to court, where that they have fifty-four counts of this or fifty counts of this, and it, it just depends on which crime they commit, and you can get up to those ten of uh, you know charges depending on what um, crime you committed, okay? But these are all the offenses that are listed in our um, Proceeds of Crime um, Act and they fall under these various laws that um, make up the framework of the anti-money laundering framework, okay? So please make sure that none of us, you know, we, like I said, we're being, being internationally watched, all the laws were repealed and replaced in 2018. Um, the FATF, the European Union, actually blacklisted us because they wanted to come in and 
May of 2020 to work with the FIU to ensure that, you know, the action plan that we put in place to get off the blacklist was um, being kept up to date and we were doing what we are supposed to do. And so internationally for a very long time, you know, nobody was ever charged. And so they're, they're, they're wondering, are we just law abiding citizens? And they feel like we need help, you know? And so normally the innocents, you know, normally suffers for the guilty. And so right now we just need some people to go before the courts and go to jail and actually be prosecuted for these crimes that have been committed for years. So of course we see five politicians being brought before the courts for the first time four already off, more than likely the fifth one we get off, right? So we want to make sure that in our duties or in our organizations, our functions, we know what our function entails. We know the risks that are associated with our functions. We want to ensure that controls are in place and we are aware of what the controls are. We want to know that when the police comes in, we can explain to them this is our job and this is what I did. The person came in, it was outside of their profile. However, they bought the ASU contract. I looked at it, it appeared to be legitimate. Unfortunately, it wasn't, but at least I won't be charged with collusion. You know, and you will be charged with collusion when you don't do your job properly or when you don't even know your job. When you can't explain what the controls are in place to protect the institution or what steps you should have taken to ensure that these accounts are assigned to me. These people are not going outside of their profile. No, Michelle Rackley is supposed to be able to come and deposit $1.3 million into her personal account on her $2,000 government salary a month. Mm -hmm. And you just say, I didn't know. Okay? So you want to be- Sometimes, Ms. Bullard, um, poor record keeping is also, um, uh, a problem in, in, in being able to fully enforce compliance. Okay, and so compliance is everybody's business. And if there's poor record keeping and it affects the job that you do, what should you do? Um, it, I mean, it should be reported. I, somebody should be okay. in place to okay. make sure that happens. Yeah, in so terms when of the police even, comes, when the police comes, make sure you have your email where you would have made that report and it's outside your hands. I, you know, you send first request, second request, third request. I've identified this risk. This can cause A, B, or C, and then you are clear. But if you just sit there and say, oh, poor record keeping, especially if you're in management, you, you could possibly go to jail. But that's why I'm saying in terms of- the system. Yeah. But in terms of, of sometimes within the organization, if there isn't um, a proper a proper system in place to ensure that, like you say, persons understand it's not just the compliance or each person has a degree of responsibility. And if, if that isn't supported by senior management, you still don't end up running into some issues if they don't see the necessity to ensure that you do have standard programs for the way you manage your information. Okay, yes, agreed. But to save yourself when the whole organization falls, right? Because mm -hmm. these things, either audit can get you or the, like I said, um, everything was re um, repealed and replaced, all the laws were updated 2018. Mm -hmm. The Bahamas took a lot of action. The Central Bank of the Bahamas created an analytics department. The Securities Commission of the Bahamas created an analytics department. They now have a hands-on approach. Years ago, they used to send out surveys, and I used to say, yes, of course, I couldn't tell the regulator. Nobody didn't have this in place or no, that policy wasn't in place. So mm -hmm. here it is, back in 2018, I'm filling out the survey for the regulator saying, yes, yes, yes. All of our staff were trained. I didn't tell them about the people who well, and on in senior management who say they didn't have time for, for compliance training. Mm -hmm. and they put it off and they put it off and they put it off. I just say yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. Sent in that survey, Central Bank came back to me immediately. Please send us a copy of your training log. Please send mm -hmm. us this. Please send us the policy. But I, I nearly fell off my seat. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And that was the day I realized, like, gone are the days where you just tick, 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 and say, yes, 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 yes. And I, they said, I said, I need a few days. They say, okay, you have three days to submit all this. So I had to run around that organization, giving training to people who didn't train and do it to do everything. Mm-hmm. And they was on me. And ever since then, they've been on me every day. Whereas you would have called the central bank and wait two weeks to hear back from them. You no, know, everybody's assigned a, um, a relationship manager. They mm-hmm. want that information today. And mm-hmm. they act today. The other day they asked me, send me all the resumes for everybody in your um, securities department. And that was a central bank. Normally you would expect a request like that coming out of the securities commission. Mm-hmm. And from that, they sent the information to the securities commission and said, we don't have sufficient experience no education in that department. We either hire somebody right away or let somebody go. And I, I'm talking about that was in a one week turnaround. They told us they, they wanted an action or we would get a fine or they would remove a license. So gone are the days when you could play around and say, oh yeah, they ain't gonna never check or they ain't gonna never know. No, they are checking and they are very present. And trust me, everybody, they extend the law before you should just be the compliance officer could go to jail. Everybody goes to jail now. And trust me, internationally, we are being watched. And I think the attorney general just came on and say, oh, about 83 people would have been charged with money laundering. Only the small people go into jail because all the big people get no one. So make sure that it ain't us that end up in jail because, you know, the Bahamas has to show the international community and not get blacklisted that we are serious. Okay, so send it. I know, you know, you don't want an entire organization. It's, you know, so many bells and whistles and channels and levels that you have to go through to get things done. But cover yourself. You send, mm-hmm. you see a, a issue, you send it to your manager, first request. You send it to your manager, second request. You send a third request and go. That is you copy compliance and cover yourself. And when the police comes, and when these things erupt, you have, yeah, you know, yeah, thing. Don't rob over it yesterday. I mean, every day, and don't fall, you know, apart over it. But document and protect yourself, and you yeah. ensure that you are not a part of the problem. You keep kept um, proper records, and you, you know, see if you can recommend. And rather than just complain and say there are no proper records, I recommend we start this process, or a review is done, or I suggest this or that. Try just your organization. If it falls, you won't have a job. So it may not be a department, so, but help, you know, you're the one in the class receiving your knowledge. Request that more of them go to training, I don't know. But don't just sit there and let it happen. No, well, I'm just saying that from the point of view of an information professional and the fact that generally um, it's something that if, you, you tend to see where, where persons, um, like you said, you have to protect yourself. So it's not for you to leave it to your supervisor or whoever to cover you. Each person has that ultimate responsibility to ensure that those particular um, records and information that document the business activities get done. But I, I just was saying in general, sometimes um, that's like one of the downfalls with regard to persons having to end up in problems with compliance and stuff like that. Okay, uh, correct. It, it could be, yeah. Yeah, correct, correct. Or you have people who, when they know they don't do some stuff or Michelle directly on the nose, they go into the shredder, right? <laughs> they go into the shredder, they shred me every day and say it wasn't me. Right, but that that um that was the problem with the the big firm, the big accounting firm in the U.S. and um um the Arthur Anderson Group in terms of trying to, but it's too late. It's too late then to try and cover your tracks by doing right. stuff like that. Right. Um. Another thing that I want y'all to do to, that will help just give you some awareness. Um. Has anybody ever watched the series Dirty Money on Netflix? No, no. Never heard of it. Dirty money. Yeah. You've watched it? Who, who yeah. said yeah? 
Cassandra. 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 Have you watched the series on um, HSBC? No, only Dirty Money. It was sort of like the Ozark, so that's why I got interested in it. Okay. Someone suggested it. Right. Okay, good. So there is a series on HSBC where I think it's um, season one, number four or five. Watch it. I, I And I want you all to see exactly, you know, what really happens. What's because a lot of, of times you go to seminars and they say, oh, this is how the um, person got away with it. and But the bank was fine this amount. And you will see that the bank was fine an amount that they made within five weeks. So they really got a slap on the wrist. They, um, I think they just, you see, after they, they hyphenated names, so um, the system would not pick up like a Mexican drug lord. Like they put a little uh, dog or a little hyphen within the name. And a lot of times you see these things in the system, these little bitches, and we don't change them. And we know that these names ain't showing up on a report. But that means that name won't be scanned every night. And we don't know that what this person doing, you know? So to protect ourselves, we need to go to our system and make sure, you know, the dots, no little hyphens, the name is in there properly. Nothing that would stop this overnight scanning from checking the names and alerting us that this person committed a crime, you know? And so dirty money, watch it. And then we'll talk about it next week. And you will see like exactly, you know, it gives you awareness of when you go into this position some of the challenges that you will face and some things that will happen. So please, please watch it. HSBC and the Mexican Drug Lords. And we'll discuss it next week. Next week. And I promise you, it will give you some insight. Okay? Okay, good. So let's, let's move on from money laundering. And let's um, talk about terrorist financing. Any, any more questions on money laundering? Do we get the gist of it? Do we <coughs> understand um, how it occurs? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And there are loads of cases. And we, as we go to the course, we will constantly, you know, refer back to the various cases. And so it'll all be clear as mud soon as, as, as we go through it. Okay. So chapter two talks about terrorist financing. And the objective of terrorism is to intimidate the population or to compare like government or an international organization to do or abstain from doing any act. Okay, and so of course we know Bin Laden is a name synonymous with terrorism. Every time we talk about, um, um, you know, terrorism, he is affiliated or Al Qaeda or Boko Haram um, or a two spinner group from the Irish Republican Army. But what I want us to focus on, and most classes I try to get us to focus on, is domestic terrorism. Um, in 2019, in the U.S. alone, there's only 365 days in the year. And I think we were to December, and they were announcing that 200 and, uh, sorry, 365 days. There were more than 365 cases of domestic terrorism in um, America. So, you know, they say America sneezes and these things happen in the Bahamas. We've seen two cases now um, the, where the Fox Hill Park has gotten shot up and then there was a shooting in Montel Heights of a baby shower where like 14 persons um, were injured or shot. Okay, so we wanna play close attention because we don't want that to sneak upon us. We want it, you know, the awareness to be there that it's not only al it's not only Ben Laden, it's, it's very present in the United States right now. And that means it could possibly be very present here in the Bahamas. So before, you know, we get to that point, we want to be aware and we want to put controls in place to ensure that our country is not infiltrated by um, any terrorism. Um, we are all familiar with September 11th. We know what happened. Um, is terrorism on that scale? Is there anything that we need to be worried about in the Bahamas? In regards to terrorism, are we susceptible to it? Um, do they see us as a weak country? Um, all these little airports that we have in their international airports in um, San Salvador and in Ilutra, do they, they think they can infiltrate us? What's, what's your take on it? Well, I think for us, <laughs> That the, for me, terrorism locally 
more in terms of gang related activity initiating and, and I could see funding with regards to them wanting to get weapons and, and terrorize the citizens to do their um, their illegal acts from, from a gang standpoint. But I feel more the terrorism with regard to what the US has experienced is, is more of a hate towards the country. And I think it's more in terms of the extremist ideologies based on um, some of their extremist religions. So to, um, see, sorry, Ms. Tucker, go ahead. Okay, so I'm, I'm seeing for us, I, I, I don't see it at that high level like in the US. And I think that the nature of what we would consider terrorism is a bit different. Like I say, in ter it's more, um, for me, I'm just thinking more in terms of what's, what's most fearful, like how we have in so much retaliation with the gangs and different things and um, organized crime activities more. But in terms of the level of terrorism from the extremist ideologies and stuff that I guess is more prevalent in the US, I just don't feel the same level for us. I don't, that's just my view. And, and I agree I just, with you. I, sorry, I agree with you that it's not at the same level, but I'm just saying a lot, if almost everything that happens in the US, we want to carbon copy it. And so, so it's not here yet, you know, in that record number. But I could see it coming, especially after what happened last week at the Capitol. Mm -hmm. You know, I could see some people being yeah. empowered to I carry out. From a political like standpoint, you, you're talking then. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, because those people are going to be well, charged with terrorism. Go yeah, ahead. Okay. Is that Erica? Yeah, I think those people should be charged with, with domestic terrorism as well, who marched on the Capitol and infiltrated the building. But however, I, I, I don't really um, agree with um, the thought process that, that domestic terrorism isn't here or that terrorism, terrorism, terrorism isn't present in our country. For the simple fact that uh, Ms. Bullitt did make a point about um, organizations. These gangs, how they, they, they're bringing in guns, they're organized, they're, they're more organized gangs now. They have their own code. That's like foreign terrorism. They have a code that they live by. They have ways to drug trafficking, to raise the funds, to purchase the guns, to purchase these things, to bring harm to persons. They, their targets are chosen for a specific reason. For example, the young guy who got killed the other day was shot in the head. He was an innocent person that loaned his vehicle to some guys who he thought were his friends. They went and they killed somebody while he while driving his vehicle. They returned the vehicle to him. He didn't know what was going on. The police came because his, his vehicle was um, identified by a witness and arrested him and demanded that he tell them only because he was at his job, his boss was able to alibi him and say, no, he wasn't. He was at his job from this certain period of time, which took him out of the, the, the initial event of the violence. However, the police demanded that he tell them who he loaned the vehicle to. And those young men put a hit on him. They killed him. They sent someone to kill him. So these gangs here in the Bahamas, they're not only trafficking drugs, they're trafficking weapons. And they're organized. Trust me, they may be young guys, but they're organized. And what I'm finding is that there's always an older person that's running the organization. Always ahead. And they are the minion. Right. And more and more of this is going on. Right. And, and I agree, I agree that that's, I'm just saying that that type of, that's more the type of terrorism that I would, would equate to here, as opposed to the more complex level in the US. But for me, in terms of terrorism, I definitely see gang mm -hmm. activity as something that's impacting us locally, in, okay. in terms of a form of terrorism. Yeah. Okay, right. And I, I, I agree. And so what we want to do is have the awareness, you know, not just focus on the Al Qaeda or, you know, the Bin Ladens, but be very aware of what's happening in the U.S. and then as well as what's happening in the Bahamas. 
and put controls in place so we are able to you know combat it before it gets complete i mean it is still a point where it's out of control but before it's completely out of control and we're just not aware okay um back in 2001 um do we know that one of those planes landed in Freeport. One of the American airline planes for 9-11 landed in Freeport. Are we aware of that? And that our immigration, even though the law had just been established in 2000, um, our immigration officers were very vigilant. Um, those terrorists did not have um, the proper visas and the immigration department did not allow them into the country because they caught an American Airlines plane into Freeport. They were purported to send this um, plane into the, I guess, the US Capitol or into the White House. But because they did not have the proper visa, they were returned right back on the same plane that they came on. And they were not able to hijack the American Airlines plane that they wanted to send into the White House. Are we aware of that? Yes. No, I wasn't. No. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, I was aware. No. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I was aware of that. Okay. That they, they had passed through the Bahamas. Right, right. And so thank God, I just could, just we got. We and did you say this was? So could you imagine if they were successful and taking that plane from the Bahamas? So, you know, the repercussions that we would have been still suffering today had, yeah. had they been successful. So thank God, you know, um, that didn't materialize. And thank God that. The immigration department, you know, a lot of times we frown on our government departments, but they were vigilant all the way back in 2001. So, so, so very good. So I, I don't want you all to think that, you know, um, this is just a U.S. thing or, uh, you know, they will use any, any means to, you know, infiltrate a system or, uh, you know, to carry out uh, their threats. And um, normally they want to finance their organizations because they, want to recruit, um, if they want to train, they need weapons, they need to travel, um, they need safe haven protection, um, they do go through various criminal activities like kidnapping, fraud, extortion, smuggling weapons, drug trafficking, um, robbery, all sorts of stuff they do to ensure that, um, um, you know, they are Acts are, are financed. And we want to just think about Bin Laden. Um, ben Laden would have lived for 10 years after um, September 11th occurred. And one thing, you know, I don't support him in any way, but I just always think about how he survived because I always say, you know, if I lost my job and I had to move home to my parents' house, there was no way I could live comfortably with. 10 wives and children and, and, and eat, you know, um, to my heart's content and have insulin every day without my mother being on my shoulder and saying, when are you moving out? When are these children going to leave? What are you doing? Are you looking for a job every day? But he was allowed to live very comfortably for, for 10 years. And so that just means that he had a very, very strong network. He had a strong network of persons because he, he would have been, the world would have been looking for him. So he had a strong network of people who believed in what he believed in and, and who supported him and our entire family, even though he may have some of his money. Really, my, I, I only have enough money. I, I think I can make it through one year unemployed with my bills. You know, he made it for 10 years. So we just want to look at that type of network and um, what his supporters, you know, believed in what he was doing. And so that's the, you know, the benefit of having a very strong network and, and people being able to, um, you know, if people believe in you and they support you, that's how long you could survive. Okay, so just think about it when you go out there and you network and you get me one and network for good, not for bad, not to, you know, cause any harm, but that's the benefit of having a very strong network, okay? So we want to look closely at, again, how he would have financed, how, because all the banks would have blocked him off. Um, he couldn't walk into a bank, open up an account, he couldn't get a salary. So we want to go to the back of the book and we want to look at case three and we want to just get some ideas on how do they actually finance these attacks 
and what are the avenues that we um, go to. And I promise you, you're going to be a bit surprised on, on some of the things that they did to be able to make this money and carry out attacks. Okay, so again, we need another reader. We need somebody uh, else. Um, Tiara already has a 10% and any volunteers? Oh, it's in case can, three. Case three, yeah. How ISIS terrorists finance their attacks. I'll read it. Okay, go, oh. go ahead, Renee. Very okay. good. How do ISIS terrorists finance their attacks? Meeting in Turkey just two days after the horrific terrorist attacks in Paris, leaders of the G20 countries issued a statement condemning recent Islamic State in Iraq and Syria ISIS attacks and reaffirmed their commitment to combat terrorism. More specifically, the group of industrial, uh, industrial nations recommitted itself to tackling the financing channels of terrorism, which, which begs the question, how does ISIS finance its international operations? ISIS is primarily financed through a wide array of criminal activities, large and small, centered in the parts of Syria and Iraq that are under the group's control. ISIS steals livestock, sells foreign fighter passports, taxes minorities and farmers and truckers, runs a sophisticated extortion racket, kidnaps civilians for ransom payments, loots antiquities, and much more. It also makes about 40 million a month from illicit oil sales alone but these sources primarily support the group's expensive state building and war fighting enterprises back home, ranging from paying teachers salaries and collecting the garbage to bribing tribal leaders and paying fighters salaries. There is, however, an entrepreneurial self-financing model that ISIS recruits and supporters that ISIS recruits and supporters around the world have been encouraged to use to fund either their travel to ISIS controlled land or perhaps their attacks in the West. While it is too soon to state with any certainty how the Paris attacks were funded, the likelihood is that they were funded in whole or in part through local criminal activities or otherwise legal activities such as the use of state welfare benefits or taking out a loan. Okay, Renee, but let's pause right there for one second for me. So let's okay. just think about it now. Um, most persons, because of Hurricane Do um, Dorian in Abaco and Freeport had to go on social service or even right now, most persons in the hotel industry because of the pandemic. Could you imagine that the persons are down there to our social service, getting welfare benefits, and rather than going home and providing food for their families, when they give you the super value voucher, you go and sell the super value voucher and send the money to ISIS. Or you get the food and you take it down to their base where they are training their um, um, fighters. And, and you say, I give you this food instead of taking this home from my family. Or you go into the bank and you apply for a loan for school fees. You are approved. And rather than sending your children to private school, you send this money to ISIS. So that's what this is saying. I'm going to apply for a loan and I'm going to send this money to, to, to ISIS. What do you think about that, Jason? I think that's extraordinary. Okay. Okay, and that's why I told you we have to read this so you can actually get awareness and believe this is how he was able to stay alive for 10 years and live a very comfortable life because of these extraordinary things that, that, that people have committed to. Okay, so just so the awareness is there. Okay, good. Renee, continue. None of these would surprise since authorities have been tracking the use of such funding schemes by prospective foreign terrorist fighters looking to join ISIS. 
Indeed, earlier this year, a financial action task force report identified several potential revenue streams for would-be foreign terrorist fighters, including robbery and drug trafficking, various social service payments, and unpaid loans. Some potential plotters or travelers took on short-term jobs to raise the money they needed, while others simply drew on their savings or student loan accounts. Consider a few examples. Michael Zehaf Bibiu, who murdered a Canadian soldier before attacking Canadian Parliament buildings in October 2014, worked at one of the Alberta oil fields to raise money for his attempted travel to Syria. Petty crimes has the potential to bring in sufficient funds for a homegrown attack or transportation to a combat zone as well. There's the case of the 15 year old boy in Montreal who held up a convenience store with a knife, stealing some 2,200 to pay for his plane ticket out of Canada. The teen's father turned him into the police after finding the money in his son's bag. Or take the four men arrested in February in Brooklyn, New York for attempting to join ISIS. Some of their funds were supplied by a supporter who operated mall kiosks selling kitchenware and cell phones. According to the indictment, a round trip ticket to Istanbul cost a mere $598. One of the defendants expected that he would not need to bring more than 400 to travel to Syria because he would not have any concerns in the land of the Islamic State. In Britain, the Metropolitan Police's Counterterrorism Command Unit has noted several cases where jihadists financed themselves through state funded welfare payments. Most recently, yeah. Yaha Rashid, Rashid, Rashid used his student loans and educational grants to cover the travel costs for himself and four friends to go join ISIS in Syria via Morocco and Turkey. Closer to home, Christopher Cornell, who stands accused of plotting to detonate pipe bombs at the US Capitol and shoot people as they ran away, simply saved money to conduct this attack according to the FBI. In several cases, including the shooting in Canada, individuals whose travel to Syria was thwarted turned to deadly attacks at home, instead easily redirecting transportation funds toward homegrown acts of terrorism. And while ISIS's governance and military expenses in Syria and Iraq are high, Carrying out an attack in the West is inexpensive. Take, for example, the January attacks in Paris against Charlie Hebdo magazine and a police officer on a kosher grocery. Ahmed Kolibli claimed to have helped the Kusha, Kushi brothers with their project by giving them a few thousand euros so they could buy what they needed to buy. The two Kushi brothers reportedly received 20,000 from Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, but the rocket propelled grenade launcher and the Kalashkinov automatic assault rifles used by the Kushis cost less than 6,000. Kulibali himself reportedly used a false income statement to take out a 6,000 euro loan to finance the purchase of weapons for the attack. And while the AQAP claimed responsibility for the Kushi's attack, Kalibali self-identified with ISIS. Another possible funding stream available to terrorist operatives in the West is old school, abuse of charity. In light of the catastrophic, the catastrophic humanitarian crisis in Syria and Iraq, the FATF warned earlier this year that the possibility of abusing charities by ISIL, another name for ISIS or its affiliates directly or indirectly for fundraising or funding activities needs to be recognized. 
Over the past year, European countries have taken action against several charities over terror finance suspicions. Last November, French authorities shut down Pearl of Hope, a charity that claimed to promote the health and education of six Syrian and Palestinian toddlers, arresting two people on charges of financing terrorism. According to investigations, while Pearl of Hope did deliver food and medical supplies, the group was also using such deliveries as a front to funnel co covert funds to jihadist group and had links to the Nusra Front. About a dozen other charities were under surveillance at the same time, some on suspicion of ties to ISIS. To date, these cases involved raising funds for terrorist activities in Syria and Iraq. But the potential for skimming small amounts of money off the top for terrorist travel or operations had authorities concerned. Okay, thank you very much, Renee. That was very good. Um, it's very long, so you can continue in your own time to um, go through it. And just so again, you could, you know, have the awareness of exactly how they finance their activities and how um, they, you know, get the money to carry out these attacks. So let's think about home. Let's think about um, the Rampley Home. You know, that's the more popular charity or the Children's Emergency Hospital. Can you imagine that we, you know, most of us perhaps when we get bonuses or at Christmas at a certain type, you know, time of year, we want to, you know, commit you make a donation to charity and could you think that um you know my old headmaster is there mr roberts um could you imagine that mr roberts does not use that money to ensure that those children are taken care of but he sends that money on to, to isis or to one of these gangs and like somebody mentioned earlier he is um you know there's a senior person at the helm of these um, gangs that are, you know, encouraging them and training them and, you know, get your thoughts on that. You, you think that's a possibility? I, th I think it's a possibility, but <laughs> I know Mr. Roberts, not Mr. Roberts, though, he, he runs a tight ship. <laughs> but that's not good. But my, good, my, good <laughs> my good principle, right? But I just saying exactly this is what has happened. So yeah. that curl of hope you know, Pearl of Hope was a reputable um, mm -hmm. um, charity that has been around for a very long time. The, the name is even familiar to me, but these are the possibilities. And so you want to be aware. And so internationally, what happened this year, I don't know if you were reading the papers and you would have seen or in your organizations where they said, you know, if you are a charity and you have an account with us, you must go and get registered. Yes. Did you see that? Right. Yes. And so people were, yes. um, we were told that there were at least 800 organizations and charities out there collecting money um, on behalf of, you know, feeding the people or, or what have you. And we were at our wits end. This is a pandemic where we need the charities to be out there. But this year they were hampered because, um, you know, the law had been staggered from 2018 and they had to put, um, I, I, I can't remember the name of the bill, but um, it came out in 2019 and it's very recent. And so this year it's being enforced. And so you would see that, you know, let's just say um, the singing bishop, um, the singing bishop would have had an account somewhere where persons would have been making donations. And they said, listen, you have to go and get registered or you have to go and get incorporated as a foundation. They pushed it um, because we see what happened with the Head Knows Foundation. Everybody aware of Head Knows and, and the legal, I think they are suing each other over a million dollars that would have been collected uh, during Hurricane Dorian. And so because of that, um, you know, internationally, again, we're being watched. So they wanna, you know, the international bodies wanna ensure that we are doing we, what we are supposed to do. We are ensuring that um, these persons cannot commit fraud or they cannot be used, you know, for a terrorist organization. And of course we know, um, you know, Bishop of, of Lawrence Woody does a very good deed by feeding um, 
the community, but would he be aware if a terrorist association, uh, you know, approached him and said, listen, um, we can give you half of the money that they deposit into the account. We just need you to send it to us, but you could take 50%. And we, we do see that happening um, before where, you know, the Africans or whomever, somebody from away saying that I have $50,000, you go to the bank and you cash that and you, you keep half and I take half. And, you know, later on, uh, a very prominent funeral home got caught up in that and, and, and they found out it was fraud. So do you think the Bishop Lawrence rule and his staff would be aware that, you know, somebody who made a donation said, I can make this donation, but I want you to send this wire to ISIS. Would he, you know, know what he should do or stop it? Would the bank be able to determine that, you know, yes, he is a deal between the people every Wednesday, but we don't have any KYC. We, he is not registered. We don't even, we can't even track the amount of money that is coming to this account and to ensure that if he collected $1,000, $1,000 was actually spent on feeding those those persons and that money wasn't used, you, you know what I mean? To, for yeah. terrorist prices or whatever. Right, so it was very harsh. It was during the pandemic. But I, I saw that he came on TV and he said, I think uh, the lawyer Paul Robe is going to help him to establish a foundation and hopefully he didn't charge him. Hopefully he, you know, because normally incorporation and stuff like that takes about two to $3,000. So hopefully, you know, he just volunteered that service. But because of the international pressure, the banks had to put those, um, you know, ads in the paper to say, come in, oh, close out your account or get it registered, or we will have to close it out, or we will have to block it. And there were deadlines and deadlines and deadlines until at the final stage, they said, like how Bishop was operating every Wednesday, if he was not registered, he would be charged $10,000. Wow. So could you imagine that you were doing a good deed, which I think, you know, mm -hmm. he was doing, assisting, you know, feeding the people every Wednesday. He was at risk of being fined ten thousand dollars because his foundation had not been established or it wasn't properly recorded. So that is the net effect of, you know, how all of these regulations and um, can affect, you know, the community by large. But I, you know, luckily, like I said, Paul Rule went into a system and hopefully the the um government was a bit lenient and I think they were because towards the end sometime in December they sent out um a letter saying that they could no longer exempt um you know some of the persons and the fine was ten thousand dollars however there was assistance I think to the legal aid school for for you know the very small um um Charity is that needed help and did not have the money to go and regularize themselves. So hopefully, you know, um, they got help. But again, that's the international pressure. Um, we from 2008, it was supposed to be in place, and they staggered it again to assist. And then, you know, Dorian happened, and then um, the pandemic happened. But again, in the midst of Dorian and the pandemic, then we had had, had nose giving us negative media and again them watching to see exactly will the Bahamas you know handle this properly uh, do they have the KYC in place can they protect um, the people who would have donated those funds will those funds indeed go to where they are supposed to go or will they just be tied up in legal issues for you know a long period of time okay um, on page 23 of the book, um, it gives, and this is very popular on the exam as well, it gives a, just a little table and it gives you the differences between money laundering and terrorist financing. Um, like Jason said, he was very surprised people would go get loans and, um, you know, use their welfare benefit and, and, and suffer. But the motivation for money laundering is profit seeking and it's normally from Ill it's always from illegitimate means. Um, terrorist financing is ideological. That means this is a belief 
that, you know, if somebody came to us today and told us Christianity wasn't real, it would be hard for us to believe Christianity isn't real. Um, and the Muslim faith, you know, a lot of them believe that when you um, become a suicide bomber and you die, your family automatically becomes rich and they get gold and silver and what have you. And so they do it because, you know, they, you know life is very tough and they find that, okay, this is a way out. I will become a suicide bomber. I will join ISIS and I'm doing something to, you know, for a better good. And so it's their belief, you know, and like I said, they grew up believing in that you must um, support these organizations. So uh, we should be thankful that, you know, um, we are not in, you know, our beliefs were not skewed from we were children to believe that we had to give our life or, um, you know, go spot these um, institutions to the death, you know, so our families could have better lives. So um, spend some time looking at um, 40, um, 23. And again, terrorist bars, money laundering is always from illegitimate means terrorist financing comes from legitimate and illegitimate means because I could go and make a donation. Um, I could just say 10% of my salary rather than giving to my tithes. I give it to ISIS and, and, and you see in that as we go through, we'll see the many different stories on how um, extreme um, persons are and it's actually working because like I said, Ben Laden would have um, lived for 10 years and these are billion dollar you see 40 million dollars from taxes you know not that they are authorized to tax the people but they just say you, you live in this community i have a gun i tax so i'll kill your whole family and it's very real okay so spend some time um reading through the book and if you have any more questions just just let me know um any any questions on terrorism no no. Okay. no. So it's clear we, we have an overview of what money laundering is. We have an overview of what terrorist financing is. Um, we'll spend some time perusing through the book and um, reading more of the cases. We'll do some research online. Uh, we'll join these um, boards and spread it. It sounds like a lot, and you don't have to do it all at once, but as we go by the end of the course, you should be comfortable and, and know where you should do research and know how to find out information and definitely be, you know, um, comfortable in what is happening in, in the Bahamas and, and know about your country and hopefully later on, because we are the future leaders, this may be our first step into making a difference and making some things happen because I always say we sit down and we talk a lot. We need people who will take some of this talking and turn it into action and make some things happen. Indeed. Okay. Okay, we good? No questions, no concerns? No, no, not right now. Not Sorry, Miss Bullet, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Me? Patricia? Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, I can. Oh, the question is, I looked um, at the homework schedule. Are we turn, turning it in according to the dates you have on the schedule? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so pick it, you know, um, people feel that the placement is easiest and so they jump right into it and then people want to wait. Other persons want to wait to, you know, get more comfortable. But yeah, what, okay. just get to the date, whichever one you, you, you choose is fine. Please, I do not want question four. It, it seems like everybody waits till the end and they want to do question four. Please not, I don't I don't want, uh, how many of you are there? <laughs> 16 questions for us on fabric, just no. I absolutely do not want that. So I want some of you to take a stab at it and you'll be very surprised. You know, you have sufficient information now for questions one and two. Right now, you just need a little bit more research and, and, and you should be fine. Um, again, all the objectives for um, terrorist financing was on page 18. And once you document some of that and, and, and give some explanations, again, this is how they channeled through the um, charity. This is how they smuggled. Somebody got a loan. 
we have sufficient information again for placement as well. We know how it is placed into the um, financial system. So two very easy questions um, to answer. Ms. Bullard? Yes, go ahead. Hi, regarding the homework questions again, I know you said uh, we don't have to turn in all four. However, if we do take a stab at all four of them, would you go over it with us? I'll probably go because I, I will have 16 pieces of work to mark. Well, so I'm true. not, if, to do 16 <laughs> times four, how many times should I come to? Plenty. Plenty, plenty. <laughs> right. So Ms. Bullity ain't going to plenty. So if you, if you really, really need some help with the question, I don't have a, a problem. At all, and if you want me to discuss one, there's there's no issue at all. Fine, I have no problem with it, but I just don't want to do sixty times four, you, you, you know, questions. That's what sixty four. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, and times four the classes. That's plenty. Yeah, that's just sixty four for this. Yeah, so that's why we only we can only do one. And again, this is only for practice. This is something I added into the um course because I found that persons got into the um final exam and you not know, having written an essay for the last 20 years and you know so I, I just put this out there just so you could practice and, and be comfortable and see where you fall down and, and get a, you know a refresh on um, essay writing okay because it's going to be marked and then cross marked and so we want to ensure that the cross marker you know is satisfied not just Ms. Bullet saying okay but I know Jason and I know what he meant you know whomever would pick up your paper and mark it should be able to, you know, understand what you wrote and it should be in proper form. Okay. okay? Thank you. Okay, good. Okay, um, let me ask you um, about February 6th. Um, unfortunately, I may have a funeral to attend on February 6th. And so I'm asking um, now what persons object to having class perhaps on that Thursday, which would be the 4th of February, uh, probably 6 to 9 p.m. Would that be a, an issue? No, not for me. No, no it's fine for me. No, okay. it wouldn't be. I, I may have another, I think I have another class to deal with. I have another um, session, so I may have to, um, I probably have to listen. Do you say it's recorded, right? Yeah, it's recorded, yes. Okay. Yeah, All right. okay. So, all right, so uh, thank you for that. So if um, you can attend on that um, that Thursday, 6 to 9 p.m., so just make a note of that, um, February um, 4, 6 to 9 p.m. instead of February 6, and that would greatly help me in trying to plan this funeral and get it off the ground and attend it, so I appreciate that. And then whomever can't attend um, can just watch the recording and Definitely, if there are any questions for the persons who um, watch the recording the week after, we'll have review, and so I will pick up anything that you need in, in the review. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, so any other questions or concerns? Well, was all of this clear as mud? Are we all excited or are we running away from this bullet? No, we're very excited. Oh, I'm so good. You're run just yet. Not yet. Yet. Uh, and, and let me just tell you that the key to this is organization. Um, it's very, like I said, it's very, very achievable. It's very comprehensive. If you read and you do your search, research, and then you understand, it'll it'll all fall into place. But if you have the difficulty reading, and uh, at the end of this course, just just off, but do pick up, you know, in another area because it really isn't for 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 everybody. Um, I don't like to read, but I was motivated by some other stuff, and so I forced myself. So you can't even bring it, you know, force yourself to read. Then just just go on to something else. And and there are other courses out there that is just as rewarding and fulfilling um, as this is. But you know, and it sometimes it gets boring, and so. This is why I ask other people to participate and, um, you know, come with your uh, newspaper clippings and your experiences through networking, you know, just to add some life to it. Because it, it, it could be, you know, exciting the whole way through. Okay, not just, just a bunch of 
you know, regurgitation of words and reading and what have you, but we could make it very interesting. And Miss Bullet talks a whole lot, and I have loads of stories that I will tell you all to try and keep you all awake and make it applicable. And, you know, sometimes you get into the exam and you can't exactly remember how everything works, but if you have a story that, you know, like my car wash guy and everybody has a car wash guy or a peanut guy that hangs around the organization and, you know, we, we just want to ensure that we keep them on the right track and they do the right thing. Okay, and so all of that helps when you get to the exam. So trust me, let the nerves um, go away, organize yourself um, towards the final exam. Um, normally, institutions give you a day or two off. Um, it'll be best to, you know, go back to work next week and ask for that day now. You know that your final exam is on February 20th. So if they do offer a study day, um, please take advantage of that study day and apply for it now. Or if you have vacation, um, I would, you know, advise that you definitely don't, um, um, you know, probably get a half day that Friday before and, and relax and unwind. And, and then pick it up. Don't try. And, you know, I you got a lot of information today. Take a rest, let your mind heal and relax and then pick it back up perhaps on Sunday or Monday and, and then start to read so you could, you know, retain the information that you would have read and organize yourself, like I said, for the final. It's very achievable from the what I've heard so far from the person who's spoken to me sounds like a very good intellectual group with good understanding. And so already in the first class, I have no worries going forward. I'm certain that we are going to get all get through this. I'm certain that um, it's going to be so exciting and interesting that you want to go on to the next step. Okay, but relax and unwind and feel good and then um, get back to it. But also schedule your time, you know, for the mothers and the wives. Um, you have you need a day off to read and, and get your work done and subscribe to all these places and so ask your significant other you know to bear with you as you go through the course and you'll find that that will assist you because a lot of times we just have people tired from a long days of work showing up the class and they take in the first half an hour done wine and Ms. Bullet is talk a lot so they don't miss the whole first half an hour or so if you unwind before you get here and relax and, and play your schedule, um, you will find that you'll be okay. And, you know, you will retain okay. and understand most of it. Ms. Bullock, mm -hmm. uh, where would the exam be? Would it be online through lockdown browser or something like that? No, um, you'll actually go into the institute and sit the exam. So oh. there'll be classrooms and they'll probably have three persons in each class. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so you're going to send the ICA handbook directly, correct? Yes, I'm going to send it right after. Oh. That was okay. my question, Ms. Bullet. Sorry, oh. the ICA handbook. Right, right. So I'm going to send it right after. And you just look at, you can peruse the whole handbook, but just for referencing, you can go, go to pages 17 to 19. So you'd know how to reference properly in your essays. Perfect. Okay, great. So if there are no further questions, everybody have a fabulous weekend and we'll pick this up again next week. Thanks, you too. Okay, bye -bye. Take care. Okay. But, and remember okay, to read bye. chapters um, three and four and be prepared. No problem. Okay. 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 Excellent. Thank Take you. care. Have a good weekend. You too. You too.